Um, okay. Um, Bruce Tullock's my name from Bitscope Designs. And uh, we have been um, around for a while, since 1999. We've actually presented at Slug once before about our mainstream business, which is test and measurement. As you see here from our homepage, um, where we uh, typically work oops, um, in mixed signal uh, test and measurement in a variety of markets. Um, but one of them which we have more recently moved into, and you may, if you are interested in test and measurement equipment, um, we've got bitscope.com slash pi, um, <coughs> which is our Raspberry Pi oscilloscope. Um, now, we make a range of peripherals, um, mixed signal oscilloscopes, spectrum analyzers, logic analyzers. They work with Windows, Mac, Linux, and as of about two and a half years ago, Raspberry Pi. And that's what started us on our journey with Raspberry Pi, uh, since which time we've been doing a lot of stuff with it. And I'm going to talk tonight about the work we've been doing with a new product called Bitscope Blade, uh, which is, as in Blade Server, it's using Raspberry Pis to build servers of all sorts, from single node to uh, 20 or 40 node clusters. Um, just so you know what, um, what the Bitscopes themselves look like, this is an example of one. Um, small devices they are really, like so. You can have a look at it afterwards. Um, and they can plug in, be powered by and run with a Raspberry Pi. So our interest in Raspberry Pi is using it as a host. As you can see in this example here, little bits go connected to a circuit, talk to a Raspberry Pi, which has got the waveforms up there. Um, We've since developed a lot more software around the Raspberry Pi, particularly in relation to servers for test and measurement and data acquisition and control, industrial control. Um, so perhaps what I could do now is take you to Pi Cluster Computing, which is what we're here to talk about tonight, um, just to give you an overview of, what we, of who we are and what we do. So um, we have done, whoops, this computer, there we go. Um, real-time test and measurement, and a lot of programming, electronics design. Um, in recent years, particularly with Raspberry Pi, a lot of network-based um, and remote test and measurement. We've been working for some time now in partnership with Premier Farnell Element 14, who manufacture and distribute our products around the world. And most recently, we've been working on developing cluster and cloud edge IoT solutions, as in edge computing close to the edge. Um, so, question is, what is Bitscope Blade? Pretty simple, really. It's a standardized set of motherboards for plugging Raspberry Pis in to connect them up together in racks, um, standalone, um, and in clusters. So there are three of them. There's Uno Pi, Duo Pi, and Quattro Pi. And Uno Pi has one slot for one Raspberry Pi and a hat. GeoPi has two Raspberry Pis, Quattro Pi has four Raspberry Pis. Um, the benefits of Bitscope Blade in terms of industrial deployment of Raspberry Pi is that it provides a robust mounting solution, which I'll explain shortly, and it has a very flexible power supply solution. Anything from seven to about 60 volts can be used to power the thing. So you can use passive power over ethernet, UPS, solar, battery, whatever you want and you won't have any problems with Raspberry Pi. One of the issues that's plagued Raspberry Pi in a lot of these sorts of applications in the past has been reliability of the power supply. So here are the main, uh, the main points. Um, so the question is, why use Raspberry Pi when there's a whole lot of other uh, types of computers that you can use for this sort of thing? Well, clearly it's cheap. Uh, it's also remarkably reliable when you power it correctly. Um, it has a very um, well-developed ecosystem of software, being Linux-based mostly, but of course it runs other things, including Microsoft IoT, for those people that want to go down that path. Um, and there's quite a wide range. Since the foundation introduced the HAT standard with the Model B, there's a standardized set of accessories um, for expanding capabilities of, of, the, um, of the Raspberry Pi. So for those reasons, we figured it was a good choice for um, 
cluster computing. But when we say cluster computing, we're not really looking at data intensive number crunching, although you can do that sort of thing to some extent. We're looking more at physical computing. So the interface between the real world and the virtual world and crunching the numbers uh, of what you receive uh, from Bitscopes in our case, but lots of other things. So just to have a look at the Uno Pi board itself, you can see the uh, there's actually a prototyping block, which is an optional thing you can plug on, where the Raspberry Pi and the hat or the prototyping area sit side by side. Then uh, with the to give you an idea of what the actual features of it are, you can see um, we've got um, the Raspberry Pi uh, connector plugging in the side here and mounting mounting holes. The blade then has a ground and VCC tabs at either end of the board, which I'll explain in a minute. Power can be applied um, via the 2.5 mil power jack. On the hat side, you can plug in a hat over this area and you've got two additional USB uh, sockets for providing power to addition to other peripherals and you've got another power connector here so you can uh, provide auxiliary power to a variety of other um, products for example the Raspberry Pi display can mount on top of this or with a Raspberry Pi with a hat can be wall mounted or box mounted whatever you want um, the power is regulated on the board providing between three and four amps for the board which is more than enough for two three or four Raspberry Pis plus accessories that you might connect onto them so there's the Duo Pi, which looks similar, but the hat slot is replaced by a second Raspberry Pi. And there's the Quattro Pi version with slots for four of them. So you can see it's basically just a larger version of the same thing. This model is quite popular, has proven to be quite popular because four computers uh, is enough to actually start experimenting with cluster computing and, and uh, setting up various software uh, architectures. Being Linux Debian based and Raspbian is uh, Jesse derived, pretty much all the open source software uh, solutions that are available on that platform can run on the Raspberry Pi. So that's what a Quattro Pi looks like populated in this case with four Raspberry Pi 2s connected via Ethernet. Uh, we actually have um, a rack solution like so, where it's a 1U rack with a small switch uh, the Quattro Pi and the whole thing is actually commercially available as a single rack box like so. Now you want more units. So here we have the way to do that. This is what we call the cluster pack. So here you've got five Quattro Pies. So you've got 20 Raspberry Pis in a single pack. Uh, we've given a lot of thought to how you would mount and uh, power this. You'll see down the bottom uh, there are holes in the bottom blade, so the Raspberry Pis at the end of each blade can actually be connected via HDMI to monitors or um, other outputs. Um, you power it this way. It's pretty straightforward. The top plate is 7 to 60 volts, the bottom plate is ground, uh, and then all the Pis in the cluster just get powered when you uh, power the rack. You can then put them together in a large case, like so. They've got a smaller version here. This one here is a 40 pi, that's 160 core um, cluster that you can construct with that. So here is the 21. So that's what this little guy here is. Fairly compact. There are some other benefits of Raspberry Pi and cluster computing. As you're aware, it's a very low power computer. So that uh, can be run off one 60 or 70 watt plug pack uh, with full compute uh, capability. Raspberry Pi is also blessed with lots of USB I.O., which from our point of view is quite useful. Um, so there's what they look like from front and behind. Wiring it up is pretty straightforward. So you can see there's just one ground and one VCC to top plate and bottom plate, and then a strap between the two sets of plates that are inside one uh, blade rack. So two cluster packs in one blade rack. So it's, it's an easily expandable system physically. There you can see the actual elements of the uh, rack, and the cost of this is of the order of, for a, a Quattro Pi with, one, with four nodes in it, and it was about $190. 
up to about uh, $590, $600 for a, for a large one for all the rack interconnectivity and so on, and then just add the Raspberry Pis and away you go. So there you can see that's the Blade family of products. Uh, the Raspberry Pi at the center of it all, Uno Pi, Duo Pi, Quattro Pi, and the various arrangements and single blades, clusters, racks, and large cluster racks. So how do you make it all go? What can you do with it? Here's an example of one application, which is a sensing server, a Raspberry Pi Model A and a Raspberry Pi Sense Hat. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Sense Hat, but it's a hat peripheral that provides a range of environmental sensors, temperature, pressure, humidity. It's got a compass, it's got um, accelerometers in it. It's got a little joystick on the top um, where you can actually send input information. It's got a matrix of LEDs you can provide output. The whole thing can be powered via PoE, power over Ethernet cable plugged into this so it can be remotely mounted. It's quite a convenient small server. Here's another one, which uh, in this case is an industrial data acquisition system or data acquisition system and control. In this case, you've got a Raspberry Pi. You've then got a Pi Face controller, which gives you uh, various servers and other control signals you can use, PLC type applications. And underneath two Bitscope hats that each of them give you two analog and eight logic channels of data acquisition in a package which all ups about $200. So um, for putting that uh, together with the Raspberry Pi and um, Blade. This is a popular one, <coughs> just basically a Duo Pi on a wall with a hard disk and a network switch for a very low cost and reliable office server. And we've packaged it up like so with the new Pi drive from Western Digital. I'm not sure if you've seen that, but it's a USB 3 powered and connected hard drive. Um, and you can run a failover redundant dual server for whatever you want, DNS, DHCP, web, file server, own cloud, whatever. And it all runs very effectively with the Raspberry Pi 3, which is what these two little guys are here. You can maintain the networking using Wi-Fi between them. You don't even need to plug in Ethernet cables if it meets your bandwidth requirements. Uh, here's a, a bigger example, a complete rack with switch and some bitscopes down the bottom. So that's a uh, cluster computing, physical computing system using cluster technology with a gigabit switch up the top. Each Raspberry Pi, of course, 100 megabit, but with the back plane of the gigabit switch, so long as you're not trying to pump all uh, gigabit through one Raspberry Pi, you've got, it's, it works very well. And down the bottom, array of bitscopes that are plugged into the USB ports of the uh, Raspberry Pi. So you can scale it physically, quite small to quite large. So here's an example of what a schematic of a data acquisition system might look like, where you have four, just this is a Quattro Pi, that little unit I showed you before, four Raspberry Pis, each one of them driving four bit scopes, each one of those providing between two and 10 data acquisition channels. So in a very low cost, small physical configuration, you can set it up so that you can get um, 96 analog channels, I think, 32 analog, 96 digital uh, channels of data acquisition in a very compact form factor, all using a variety of software solutions, some which we provide, others that are available from others elsewhere. Now, of course, being Raspberry Pi being Linux, all your usual Linux software stacks can be supported and run. And in particular, with cluster computing, you're going to be interested in those sorts of things. Um, and we've been testing and running various examples of this. We ran a test uh, with Blender, the 3D rendering program, and uh, found that the scaling was somewhere between eight and 12 to one compared to a high-speed i7 process. You need about uh, eight to 12 Raspberry Pis to be able to achieve the same uh, capability. However, the power consumption, the heat generation, uh, and the cost was all significantly lower. So it really depends, horses for courses, what it is you're trying to do. So just some example applications for Blade, particularly in clusters. So Apache Mesos um, for uh, cluster operations, Spark if you're doing big number crunching, Docker, which I understand you guys are familiar with and have talked about for some period of time, of course, runs 
on Raspberry Pis. Makes it very convenient to um, spin up and spin down whatever software stacks you want. And it will just works in this environment pretty much the same as it works in any other POSIX or Linux environment. Um, edge computing and microservers in the era of Internet of Things and machine-to-machine -machine networks and that sort of stuff. We see a lot of application there. And uh, cloud storage solutions, educational applications and so on. The sky's the limit, really. To make it all work, we have a software platform we've developed for this which sits underneath everything else. It effectively takes the core Debian distribution and then layers installers over it to tailor the operating system running on each node. And it has capabilities. It's quite simple to use. You can see it's simply download the core Jesse Lite image of Raspbian and then connect your Raspberry Pi to the internet. Uh, suck down the core.tgz, unpack it, and run the installer that's included with it. Um, that gives you a baseline of a, a number of um, command line utilities, which uh, allow you to back up and restore, uh, copy a running node to another running node in a cluster or replicate them across those clusters. And as I say, it sits underneath tools like Docker, where you can do similar sorts of things by pulling in instances from, a, from Docker Hub. This actually allows you to migrate from one node to another the entire operating system. Um, the Raspberry Pi 3 also adds at this stage in alpha, but will be finished soon as Pixie Boot, so you can do Ethernet boot. You don't actually need the SD cards plugged into the Raspberry Pis. Um, so from a cluster computing point of view, it'll make things more convenient. But from where we stand with these tools, you often don't need that because uh, the replication capabilities, we make extensive use of rsync um, for uh, running up and spinning up live systems from one another. So we've been working with these guys amongst others on developing uh, use cases and examples. Uh, we've been developing a lot of the hardware in physical IO, test and measurement, and data acquisition. PyFace have been doing control, similar things, Element 14, and of course Raspberry Pi have been very helpful. So that's me, um, <laughs> sitting in front of a Bitscope education platform, um, and uh, that's Bitscope. So any questions? I've got some things which I'll show you here in a minute physically. Any questions on what I've presented so far? That uh, uh, office, the small office server, where we have two Raspberry Pis and a hard yeah. disk and that sort of thing. Yeah. I'm assuming the two Raspberry Pis are for redundancy? Yeah. Well, you can set them up that way if you want. Uh, or you can set them up as doing different things. So one might be a file server, the other one might be a gateway uh, router or something like that. Uh, choice is yours. Raspberry Pi 3 is really convenient that way because you can just plug your Ethernet from your modem or upstream, default route, and then you can set it up as a wireless access point, which is what we do in our office. Uh, and you can then have replicate, uh, repeaters if you want. Um, all built into a $35 computer. It's pretty ridiculous, really. Um, and, uh, of course, it's got Bluetooth as well uh, built into it. Yep. Um, have you had any problems with Raspberry Pi overheating the, the Raspberry Pi 3? No. Uh, we've got little heat sinks for them. Um, <laughs> uh, the Raspberry Pi 3 is uh, it does run hotter, and it does chew more juice. Um, if you put the heat sinks on them, as we do by default in these blades, and particularly when the blades are vertical convection cooling, they never rise to a temperature where the governor cuts in. So it seems to be fine. Yeah. Yeah. Have you tried running a spark master on it? Uh, we haven't, but one of our customers has, and it's worked fine. Um, the what what we'd like to do when we've got we're releasing the Pi core that I uh, showed you earlier. Uh, and the installers. One of them is we'll be setting up uh, Apache Spark as a. What we want to try and do is set this up as like appliance computing, where you have a SD image, just plug it in, and it runs, and it's got the full software stack for what you want to run on it. So an example that we've been working on is Node.js, of course. Um, everyone uses Node.js, like it or love it, um, and uh, we're trying to do that for a variety of platforms. Desktop, uh, just a Raspberry Pi desktop. Um, our application software, which does this, which can run on the Raspberry Pi desktop, but also servers and uh, Docker is another one that we're spinning up. So we'd like to try and have uh, the most popular ones available just as a click, install, run kind of arrangement. How much the max uh, in, in terms of memory? Because Spark as an application is really 
memory hungry and how much is it? So we're looking at a variety of storage solutions. On Raspberry Pi itself, it's limited to a gig per node, um, but there's uh, a gigabyte oh, right. yeah, um, uh, of RAM. Uh, you can't expand that on the Raspberry Pi. Yeah. Now, we, as I think I mentioned at the beginning, um, Raspberry Pi we chose for a variety of reasons, but one of them is its ubiquity, low cost, availability of everyone who knows how to program the thing. But the heading there says, why use SOCs like Raspberry Pi? So this is not limited just to Raspberry Pi. I don't know if you've been watching what's happening in the market, but there are quite a few Raspberry Pi compatible boards out there. Uh, there's Odroid um, and there's Banana Pi. They have the same form factor, can plug into and use Bisco Blade. Uh, there's an interesting one called UP, which is an uh, Intel chip-based um, version. So what we're looking at with Blade is Raspberry Pi as king of the hill. Everyone knows about it. It works well. It does have some limitations. Uh, the UP board has 4 gig of RAM on it, for example. It runs up to 2 gig uh, CPU quad-core uh, ARM, uh, Atom-based core. So you can scale these things using other hardware uh, platforms than just the Raspberry Pi. Not at this point. Um, we're getting. We've got some Odroids coming, and the upboard is also arriving soon. Um, we, our approach is not to create binaries, particularly for open source software. Rather, it's to create installers that will suck it in, and we may maintain our own PPAs for um, packages that we offer. Um, but we really want to try and keep this as close to upstream. Oh, the Biscoat software? Yeah, uh, Biscoat hardware is compatible with pretty much everything because all a Biscoat needs is a serial port, the USB serial port, or just needs a simplex communications channel. Yep. Uh, I've heard about uh, Raspberry Pi to being sensitive to Xenon flash. To? Xenon flash. When you, there's a flash, yeah. you, the Raspberry Pi reboots. Uh, the... The Raspberry Pi 2, there was, was a chip on the board which was uh, not epoxy enclosed, encased. Um, that's not an issue with the Raspberry Pi 3, I think. Um, they fixed that, didn't they? So so I don't think that's an issue anymore. Um, so, yeah, no, it's not, not a problem. Uh, working with the Element 14 uh, guys, um, <coughs> Farnell Element 14 are responsible for about three quarters of the Raspberry Pi's made. I think there's about nearly nine million of them in the market now, and they've made about six million of them. Uh, part of their program is to offer industrial customization of Raspberry Pi, where if you need, let's say about 5,000 units or more, they will spin out, if you want them to, a custom design. So they can, you might want to throw off the SD card and put on EMC, it's whatever. Any other questions? No? So um, what we might do, what you can do here, see, you've got physical examples of those products. This one, for example, you can pass around and have a look, is the Duo Pi server. Uh, here's a Quattro Pi populated with four Raspberry Pi 3s. Uh, all you need to do is apply power. They'll boot up, they'll start talking to each other, and you have a four node cluster that simply sticks on your wall if you wanted to. Likewise, uh, at the Duo Pi, uh, the Uno Pi with a Raspberry Pi, a control hat, and two Bitsco hats on the other side. Let's see what they look like. Thanks. <coughs> and then the actual blade board themselves. So um, uh, what we're interested to find out is if you guys have thoughts about applications for this, particularly in relation to cluster computing. We do a lot of stuff in the physical computing and test and measurement data acquisition space, but uh, not a lot in cluster computing, particularly 
more distributed stuff, not necessarily high bandwidth or high floating point crunch, number crunching capability. Um, we'd love to hear from you. When you said uh, supply about 60 volts, what does it top out at? 60 volts. Okay. So it's it's nominally 7 to 48 volts being a common standard for power over Ethernet, yeah. and, and the got, the regulator will work up to 60. Okay, that's to give up this cell equalization on a need 48. Sorry? That's to give that cell equalization on a need 48, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It's a bit more than 60. Is it? Okay. Do you know about that? Cell, cell equalization cell goes up to more than 60 volts. 60 to just in telecom. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah. all, all, all of the components on, on MEG48 uh, spec to, uh, to 60, to 64 or 70 volts. Okay. Um, basically, we put it to 60. So we normally say 48, 48. That's an issue if you make with something like that. You probably have to put some sort of um, voltage drop or some sort of protection on it. Um, yeah. Just so that would be more significant. Yeah. Switch that back out while you're doing so we could. Thank you. On most of the retail side, but you don't need the, the 60, so it was much, much more than 60 <coughs> months more than the 48. It's just for occasionally you should. Was out of the bank. <coughs> well, they're happy for any so they they tolerate transients or dips. So if you if you have a situation like that, it'd probably be a good idea to drop it down by six or ten volts because you still have plenty of headroom. So that's going to be the solution. It, it's just a rare occurrence that tends to to, to uh, trouble some of these. Yeah. Are you able to mount uh, an SSD card there, or? Uh, uh, yes. So I might have something here. I can show you about that. Um, uh, I can't show it to you because it's not my computer. Yeah, um, it's but it's but uh, SD cards, SSD cards. Um, so obviously, anything that connects via USB, obviously, you can just plug straight in and run. Now, the Raspberry Pi 3 will get you to about 40 megabytes per second, but not more than that. If you've got an SSD that goes way beyond that, well, you're not going to use the capability of it. Um, we're also looking at, there are a number of hacks available on the market, which uh, are made to plug in MSATA modules. Uh, so, in fact, I've got one of those here. Um, you can see, for example, here's a blade with a Raspberry Pi, and mounted on the top is an MSATA module. Uh, one of the beauties of Raspberry Pi is there are all of these sorts of accessories available, so if you want to add those features, you can. I, I, guess I can see the future of, of, of Raspberry Pi as a cluster computing. If you have that, remove that limitation where in memory, one gig of memory is, is for me, is not enough. Yeah. I mean, I'm yeah. as a Spark user. Yeah. And, and there's the drive. Yeah. So then once you remove that limitation or whatever, then I think the Spark. Uh, Cluster, get I think for the Spark cluster, you're really going to uh, the upper would probably be the preferred uh, choice. Yes, well, you know, whatever. whatever. I mean, yeah. yeah, but that, that's uh, that's something that I've been looking at as well. Yep. Yeah. That's the reason why I'm asking here. Yeah. Uh, see, you know, I I know the limitation of the uh, Raspberry Pi. Yeah. So then it's not as useful now. No. The Raspberry Pi three. Uh, we were at the launch in uh, in February, February 29th, yeah. um, and the pitch for the Pi 3 really is, in terms of the industrial applications, as a hub for IoT. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. it's not really. I mean, you know, yeah. There are applications who are more suitable for that. Yeah. What so I what is it that you're doing with Apache Spark? Just well, it, it's a data science stuff. Okay. You know, if I can put some uh, two terabytes of the 
uh, yeah. stuff there and yeah which can be easily uh, yep. put in so there are uh, obviously that, applications that are memory resident like that yeah uh, are going to need larger uh, RAM. Yeah, I understand. I was just looking yeah. to see, you know, what it can do. You know, yep. I mean, if you, I'm maybe pushing the the limit already, but if it can do well the job, then it, it's a very good solution. You know, uh, so, it's very cheap. Yeah. Um, if you're interested, I can give you a bit more of a rundown uh, about Bitscope itself, the test and measurement tool that plugs into Raspberry Pi and, and uh, Linux machines in particular. Um, you can see here Raspberry Pi and a Bitscope Micro, which is uh, one of our most popular models. Um, is this going to work? Yeah, there we go. So this is shows you what Bitscope Micro is. Um, a tiny little probe with USB at one end and a connector for two analog and eight logic, two of them by comparators from the analog. Basically, a mixed signal oscilloscope, which uh, 10, 15 years ago would have cost you upwards of five thousand dollars. This one's 140, so it's quite a bit cheaper. So what sort of bandwidth does a oscilloscope measure up to? Uh, well, at this one uh, measures up to 20 megahertz as analog bandwidth, with 40 mega sample per second digital capture capability. Uh, we've got others that uh, run at faster speeds. This one is a very popular one with. Um, makers, people working in Arduino and Raspberry Pi, and sort of class electronics. Um, so, as you can see here, it just plugs in and is powered by the uh, Raspberry Pi in this instance. Um, so, it's got a waveform generator built into it, pat logic pattern generator. So, just with a loopback, you can actually start playing with waveforms that it generates um, by itself. The application software looks like this. This is um, Biscope DSO, which is the main software that comes with it. It runs on Windows, Macintosh, Raspberry Pi, Linux, everything. So, the, uh, the comment, do you, do you see binaries for the other, other arms? Really? Uh, yeah, we are shipping more of them. Um, so, ARM, ARM 6 Plus and ARM 7, ARM Hard Float. It'll actually work on the other. Yes, it's been, it'll work on. Uh, uh, x86 and arms arm 7 upwards um, and obviously most x86 so the Galileo is one platform that people use it with which is the Intel's um, low-cost computing system um, and uh, we intend to make it available on as wide a range of devices certainly all the ones we support with blade uh, will, will be compatible with it so do you charge for the software? Is that open source as well? No, some of, most of it's open source, some of it's not. Um, uh, none of it, it's bundled in the cost of Bitscope. So if you buy a $150 Bitscope, you then get access to all the software that runs it on whichever platform you're you're using it with. What's the output impedance of the waveform generator? Uh, 50 ohms? 150, on this one, yeah. <laughs> So that's the uh, connector port, what it looks like. Um, so you can see there's an analog channel A, analog channel B. Logic 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. 4 can double up as a waveform generator. 5 can double up as a clock generator. And logics 6 and 7 are driven from the analog channels via variable switching level comparators. The logic channels are otherwise 3.35 volt uh, tolerant. So as an example of a little board that we built to test and run this, this is a typical mixed signal circuit um, showing you a 4-bit counter, a D to A converter, a filter, and a Schmidt trigger, which can, in, when you run them together, produces a triangle waveform from a digital counter driving a voltage up, which switches the Schmidt trigger, which then starts counting down, so it's an up-down counter, implemented using logic and analog circuitry. Um, bit scopes are programmable, and one of the key features of them is there's two ways to program them. You can program them directly, they've got a virtual machine in there that runs a, a bytecode protocol, 
and all you need is a serial interface or a USB serial interface to talk to the BitScope and you can program it directly. Or you can program it through a library, which is a C API function call library that we've got. Uh, all the functionality of our software is built on that library. So you can write your own if you want to or make changes to it. <clears throat> this is an example of how the scripts work. Um, in this case, we've got a register, an address, a value, and a store operation. So the address reg register 99 has the value 12 hex stored in it. And so you just program a whole lot of registers and then issue a command, in this case, the Z command, which is uh, to initiate the waveform generator, the clock generator. So we've specified um, the clock period, the right where the rising edge fall falls, where the falling edge falls, <coughs> and the control. Programming it in Python. So we've got a thing called PyLab, which is a Python programming environment where you can write your own uh, instrumentation or data acquisition applications, uh, and that talks directly to bytecode. Full source code is available. It's on um, uh, Bitbucket, not GitHub, but um, you can download it and run it up with uh, your Visco. Uh, this is an example of a Raspberry Pi driven workstation. You can see here's a range of the different software applications or running four instances of it on four Bitscopes. We've got a Bitscope Mini, two Micros, and another one over here all powered by and run by one Raspberry Pi. So they're quite capable little computers, those clients. Um, we can also run them as servers. So here's a Raspberry Pi driving four Bitscope micros, giving you eight analog channels, uh, 24 logic channels, and a range of accessories that you can plug into uh, Bitscope. We've got some new ones coming. Ones to allow you to connect oscilloscope probes, which have BNC terminated connectors and industrial port adapters, which give you current loops, opto-isolation, whatever kind of uh, connection you need, Bitscope's got uh, various solutions for that. So that, in a nutshell, is Bitscope. Um, and it works with the Blade architecture. So, yeah. So, is the Blade more for, like, I'm just trying to, because at the start you said it's not for more general computing or is it physical like, computing is it more for that or is it more for exactly okay so blade anywhere where someone wants to use a raspberry pi you can use a raspberry pi with a blade and what it will give you is a reliable power supply a good way to mount it and access it from our point of view it also mounts uh if you've seen that row of four of them a whole yeah. bunch of usb ports very conveniently oh. located oh. so it gives you lots of io particularly when connecting um, bit scopes, which is clearly where our interest lies. Yeah. But uh, anyone who's got uh, lots of physical devices, Internet of Things type applications, particularly industrial Internet of Things. Mm. So one uh, application we're working on is with a company that is, uh, has got multi-channel data acquisition requirements on machines running the steel mill. And mm. they have like 60 signals that need to be monitored in various ways to monitor the operation of the machine. Uh, previously, the equipment to do that sort of stuff. National Instruments have solutions for doing those sorts of things. And for something that size, you'd be looking at um, maybe $100,000, $200,000. Uh, with a BitScope-based solution, you can get away with maybe $20,000 for the same sort of thing. Um, so it's a you know price-performance basis. It's quite good. And it's also very flexible from a programming and software point of view. So you have an application that doesn't quite fit the criteria of the software that's off the shelf. You can spin out your own solutions with this quite easily. Are there any, did you just talk about all the different hats that are available? Yep. yep. <coughs> I'm just wondering how well it would do if you had a hat that had a bunch of Ethernet ports and using the Raspberry Pi as a, uh, a router. Uh, <coughs> so you're saying a bunch of Ethernet ports like a hub? Uh, you can do that. Uh, hubs are a dime a dozen, though, um, off the shelf. I was thinking like uh, PFSense or something like that. Yeah. You could run a PFSense as a uh, router that yep. it's basically an application on Linux and the that is basically uh, firewall, router. Uh, so I think, I mean, we actually just this week were speaking with a company that's very interested in it from a UTM perspective. Uh, uh, unified threat management. Okay. So, you know, edge detection, yeah. intrusion detection. 
So you have a couple of pies, some of them looking the outside of the firewall, some of them the inside of the firewall, and other ones running deep packet inspection on traffic that's going through and emails and what have you, uh, running software like Sophos. Um, we discovered that Sophos as a proprietary application won't run on Raspberry Pis in Blade because it's, X8, it's compiled for x86, but it will run on the upboards. So in this architecture, you can, you can still do that sort of thing. So any situation where you want to sprinkle a few servers uh, around or, or set up something like that, Blade makes it very easy to do it with Raspberry Pi or Raspberry Pi compatible SOCs. Okay. I was just wondering about the performance in terms of if you had like a, a Raspberry Pi with say four or five Ethernet ports, how well it would cope with data with Ethernet traffic or how much traffic it would cope with? Uh, well, in the case of the Raspberry Pi, the Ethernet connectivity goes through the Broadcom chips USB 2 port. So you're limited to what its capability right. is. So not, very not very fast. You can do it. You can use it uh, on the serial fast, zero fast, you can get it fast. If you use, sorry? There are 100 megabit serial adapters, I squared C. I squared C, 100 megabit, don't think so. Uh, SPI maybe? <coughs> There's, okay, the, the Raspberry Pis. There's guys that make it for the zero, uh, just to make it look faster. Uh, so the interfaces on the Raspberry Pi, obviously you've got GPIO, you've got the I2C, SPI, you've got a serial port. You've also got an SD port, which is a four-bit addressable bus that's used for SD cards. Uh, they use, there's two of them on the Broadcom chip. They use one of them on the Pi 3 to talk to the chip that does the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. It gives you about um, uh, 20 megabytes per second top speed. Um, talking to an SD card, that's how they talk to the SD card on the Raspberry Pi. Um, so those, there are a variety of options. None of them are super high speed on the Raspberry Pi. That's not really the point of it. But with the other... the other it's just as an alternative for pe uh, people who are making uh, uh, ports for the Pi Zero uh, just to, to show it off the... Yeah, there's been a couple of those. There was an interesting one in Japan where they had 16 Pi Zeros in a cluster. And they had a, a, a baseboard where they plugged them into USB and they had the microchip hubs to route them using USB as the uh, interconnectivity um, layer between them. Um, not particularly practical, but quite fun. Um, someone else recently, I think it's called um, a Cluster Pi, has got a hat uh, and on it four Pi Zeros slot and underneath it plugs onto a Pi 3, so then you've got a five uh, five computer cluster. So I'm not quite up on the different versions of Pi, what's Pi Zero? Uh, okay, so Pi Zero is, was released just before Christmas and it's half the size of a hat and it's five dollars. So it's a five dollar Raspberry Pi. If you can get your hands on one, yes. Well, I think it's a, the single core version of the core. It's, it's the original BCM yeah. 30, uh, 2835, which appeared on the original Raspberry Pi, so it's not particularly powerful. It does have the same GPUs in it, so with the latest edition of Pi Zero, you can plug a camera in one end, display in the other end, you've got a full um, video conferencing right. computer it's platform gig. for five it's bucks. It's a bit faster. Yeah, it's a bit faster. Yeah. 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 The original Pi, I think, started... I'm assuming it also doesn't have some of the... Uh, interface is so much smaller. It has a USB to go port on it. It's got a USB port for power and it's got a micro HDMI cable on it. So it's got everything you need to do to be a basic. It doesn't have Ethernet on it. I, I did have one of the uh, earlier Raspberry, so it was like the first Raspberry one. Or something yeah. Like that. And I did try to use it as a desktop. And I found it too slow. Too slow. Yeah. Yeah, quite You'll quite find that since uh, the move to Raspberry Pi 2, which was the next iteration, that's a quad core 32 bit ARM, it's much better. The right. big problem with the original one is it was a single core, and a lot of the IO, the USB IO, happened, uh, was managed by interrupts on the ARM. The ARM really was a sidecar to these two graphics cores. That was, the original chip was designed for mobile phones. Um, and what they did with the Pi 2 is they spun out a, a new version, exactly the same chip, but they threw out the little single core ARM 6 and put in a quad-core ARM7. Uh, the new Pi 3 is a quad-core 64-bit uh, version of that chip. So um, much improved graphics. The, uh, the graphics has been the same pretty much the whole way along. Pretty good. 
for okay. a, much improved performance in a desktop. System. Yes, yes. Yeah. It's usable at, apart from one uh, missing element, which is almost there, which is OpenGL Accelerated X. So X11 hasn't been, uh, doesn't have the benefit of OpenGL acceleration until now. So Eric Anholt was commissioned to develop uh, the direct render interface and the OpenGL interface for X11. Raspberry Pi has always supported OpenGL and OpenGL ES. You've been able to run Minecraft on it since the beginning and it's been quite fast and smooth and on the Pi 3 it's even faster now. But being able to do OpenGL or 3D stuff inside a web browser or on the desktop, you've been limited up till now. But it's certainly the hardware's been capable of it all along. So you've put the up, is it the up chip, the Intel? Well, yeah, so there's a, I haven't got one here, but this physically looks like a Raspberry Pi, but it's blue, and it's got an Intel Cherry Trail, Cherry Trail Quad Core Atom on it. Yeah. So you, and you can plug it into one of those? Yeah. Have you, you've never done it? Or? We haven't done it yet. We've yeah. been, we, we're going to get one, hopefully, in the next week or two. Okay. Upboard was a Kickstarter. Well, um, I'm just thinking that heat would be a uh, well, we've, it, I don't think so. Um, with heat sinks, and we've got designs for it. At the back of it, we've also got extract room for small extractor fans. Um, so we will certainly find out soon whether or not that's an issue. We don't think it will be, but we'll let you know. Okay. No problem. Yep. Is it two gigabytes that are four? The original one was two. Oh, okay, so and then they upped it to four. Yeah. Uh, they, it was originally a stretch goal, but then they thought, I oh, know, we'll do it. Because yeah, I was looking online, it was like two, but if yeah. the new one had, yeah. The new one's got four, yeah. And I think you can get up to 64 gig of flash on board. Okay. So it's a reasonably capable Is computer. Is it faster USB or is it still 2.0? No, it's, it's USB 3.0. Oh, okay. I think it's USB 3.0. Yeah, it's USB 3.0. Okay, that's good. And uh, gigabit Ethernet. Okay. So it's, it's a capable little board. Yes. Yeah, uh, it's a little more pricey than the Raspberry Pi. It's about double the price, I think. Yeah, fair enough. It's still cheap. It's still cheap. I mean, yeah, for what you get, and that really would be quite a slick desktop. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's, I think, Ubuntu, Android, Windows will all run on it. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Makes sense. And we anticipate with the Duo Pi and Uno Pi. The blade boards will have more than enough uh, juice to power, to power them. Is the power requirement small? It draws, draws more current than the Raspberry Pi, but not a whole lot more. So, any other questions? Yep. Slightly off topic, but what are your thoughts on um, the open source hardware? Do they fit into your uh, into its scope? Well, uh, yes, they fit into Raspberry Pi's plans too, to some extent. Um, I think the next revision of Raspberry Pi, whatever that is, and they're always very tight-lipped about it, won't be a Broadcom chip. Absolutely. Uh, I think it will probably be a low-risk chip, which is the open source one. Okay. The main the main issue with open source hardware in this space is has always been patents. Um, which get in the way of sharing things in the way we have been able to do in software. It's encumbering software to some extent too. Um, uh, we're certainly all in favour of it. Um, MIPS was the closest thing that came to open designs in the past. Uh, the low risk guys are re-engineering or reinventing those bits that would otherwise be encumbered by patents to make a truly open source core. They've not succeeded yet. But they're taping it out now, I think, is it now? Do you know, Norman? The, the low risk, are they taping out yet? So they're getting close. Certain bits that were patented, yeah. Is it completely patent unencumbered? I think that I think in North America it's contested, and that's one of the reasons it's been curtailed. Yeah. So if you get the European space agency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. That's true. But certainly, it's an interesting, uh, interesting idea. And the thing that we're finding is that there is, a, you might call it, a race to the bottom in the SOC market. 
everyone and their dog is jumping on the IoT bandwagon. We're talking, you know, Intel and Broadcom and Cisco and all these big guys, and they're spinning out designs, reworking the IP they've gotten cause to actually get complete solutions. Raspberry Pi has just sort of led the way because it was one of the it was the first cab off the rank, as it were. But we're going to see a lot more of this, and there are quite a few boards. I don't know if you've seen the nine dollar chip, which was a Kickstarter campaign. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, and it's it's not particularly high power, but it's nine dollars. I can't argue with that. Yeah. The I/O they've worked out is quite good. It's a it's a nice little device. So we've got a few of them in the office. Okay. The, the open source uh, process you were talking about. Yeah. Uh, would that have a, a graphics chip, and would that graphics chip? Obviously, uh, that's uh, my understanding is a lot of the um, stuff. The graphics part is one of the more closed, closed. Uh, graphics is stuff. still a bit of a nightmare, yes, <laughs> in a word. Um, and the Mali chipset, which is very popular amongst ARM licensees, yeah. is encumbered left, right, and centre. Um, so yes, I'm I'm not really up to speed on what the latest developments in the open source hardware movement are in dealing with that issue, but I know that they're working on it. And what about the Wi-Fi? Because that's another area where a lot of uh, closed. Uh, it's the same are. issue, and in fact, Wi-Fi is a practical nightmare anyway. I mean, the stories that Evan told us when we were over uh, early this year about getting their Pi three approved in jurisdictions all around the world because it had radi intentional radiators on it was a nightmare. One hundred fifty thousand dollars they spent over the course of three months in global. Uh, jurisdictions just to get it through certification uh, so yeah and that's from a chip that is certified I mean the Broadcom chip is certified but it's not certified once you put it in your own design you've got to go through this whole process again so the regulatory obstacles to doing the sort of stuff that we do that they do here are not insignificant quite apart from the patent issues that arise from designs you might have in hardware is it probably going to move more into players like Intel who have quite a, a lot of IP and can exchange it for what they want? Uh, look, I think I think that's happening. But um, we we were invited to talk to Schneider Electric. I don't know if you know who they are, but they're a French company. They own Clipsol and APC here. They're very much in the industrial <coughs> control, yeah. and they are very interested in com embedded computing. Yep. And even they find this a bloody nightmare. Oh, no. you know, so. Uh, it's it's not a it's a tricky. So there's no European uh, player at all. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I don't. I'd hate to think there's it's a all lot going to be centralised. I think a lot of uh, the large companies that have an enormous array of patents and they do cross patents mm -hmm. licensing. Yeah. No dollars yeah. changed. Oh, yeah. Just yeah, yeah. Right? it's uh, protects the incumbents. It's hard to to, to get into the to game. Get into the game. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. the That's Chinese are all about. Sorry. That's what regulations all about. Well, yes, certainly with no. with wireless <laughs> with wireless stuff, you do have to be careful. But um, yes, the hurdles. We do are, want research. <laughs> the barriers to entry, getting getting a product through, even a simple thing like a Bitscope uh, through EMC, so you get FCC, CE approval, UL, uh, and Arosh, ten grand for a product to get it certified. It's what yeah, we pay. It's, it's and it's coming up because the market's starting to. Yeah. Great. So it's a, it's a barrier to entry, that's, that's for sure. As soon as you sell more than about a thousand of something, uh, you you run into that problem. Yeah, start making money, then we'll let the queue up into your door. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I saw that you use the the GPIOs in this board just for for power, for LED, and for a jumper. I do we have any plans for for a project that you can use like? The, the GPIOs together to make some automation or something like that? Uh, yes, but I can't talk about it too much at this point. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, have, we have new designs uh, which are taking advantage of that capability, and this is in conjunction with Element 14, uh, MBEST, their factory in China, and the, found, okay. and the Raspberry Pi Foundation. <clears throat> so, yes, there will be. There's a lot of a lot of yeah. There are a lot of possibilities there. If you've looked at the Broadcom chip, its peripheral specification, uh, you'll see that it has quite a range of capabilities in the different modes of driving yes. things. Uh, there's a high-speed 70 megahertz, 24-bit wide bus you can drive there. So yes, there are these options available. It's a very capable chip, 
and only a small fraction of its capabilities have been brought out, particularly for hardware-related uh, developments. Yes. Thank you. So, any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We usually go up to the uh, Piedmont Bridge Hotel after this to have a few drinks or whatever. If anybody's welcome.